Well, I, I, I've been treated like a king for several days. It's, this is uh, one of the most hospitable places I've ever experienced in my life, and I've just grown to love this church and the people who lead it. Thanks for having me. Um, this morning, I, I want to spend uh, a bit of time, again, talking about meeting with Jesus. I have a mentor named Eric, and, and he'll sometimes call me up, and he said, can you come, can you come up to my city, and, and we'll spend some time with Jesus. I said, okay, what, what do you have planned? He says, well, uh, we'll go out for breakfast, and we'll, then we'll talk about Jesus, and then, and then we'll go for a walk on the beach, and we'll talk about Jesus, and listen to Jesus, and then, and then, um, and then we'll have some lunch, and we'll talk about Jesus, and perhaps in the afternoon, we'll, we'll go for a drive in the mountains, and do some hiking and talk about Jesus. And, 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 then, he, and then he said, uh, we'll have supper and talk about Jesus. And then, then I want to read some things that Jesus has been saying to you from my journal through the evening. I'm like, that sounds great. And, and uh, he's, really, he, he's really instilled in me this, this desire to meet with the Lord Jesus as a living friend. And that's my heart, is that our prayer lives, our, our, our experience of God would be as a real encounter with a living friend. Well, I get to Eric's place, and, uh, and it's time for bed finally. And we had just a, a full day of talking to and listening to and being with the Lord. And uh, so I go off to the bedroom he's, he's allowed me, and I, I, I was like the, sort of like the thing with the, the clicker, Except, do you ever go to bed and, and you realize, I should have really had one more trip to the washroom? <sighs> Am I going to hold it all night? I don't think so. So, so I, ha- I head off, off to the restroom in his house, and I go in there, and I can hear Eric through the wall. Oh, Jesus, precious friend. I'm like, oh, my, my heart breaks. I, I, I'm like, this guy is in love. I, this like, Jesus is a real person to him, and when he prays, I mean, he knows the Lord's in the room. I want to be like that. By the way, I got up the next morning, and, and he said, I have a prayer request for you. He said, could, could you pray that I would be able to wake up an hour earlier so I could spend more time with Jesus? <laughs> like, maybe you have OCD or something, I don't know. But I have to say, that, that was not my experience growing up. My experience growing up was more like talking to Jesus on a phone and, and like getting his answering machine all the time. And just sort of leaving messages for him, hoping he'd check them someday. It didn't feel like a face-to-face. It didn't even feel like a conversation. It was more of a presentation to something and someone out there. And so uh, as I headed into ministry, this was a problem because I, I, I was really feeling like I don't hear from God. I mean, I can read about him, but I can read about Julius Caesar too. I can read about all the wonderful things he did. I can read about all the wonderful things ML, MLK, you know, what he did and said. And I, I want it to be more than that. I want to know God like I know my wife. I want to know God like I know my very best friend. I, wa- I, I don't want God to be this abstract idea that's out there. I, I, want, I want to meet with a real person. So with this in mind, I'm, I, I get into youth ministry, and this is quite a while ago, almost 25 years ago. And uh, this young man named Paul Reimer, he, he came to my office one day, and he was so upset. He'd been, he'd been in pretty nasty depression for several years because uh, he, he lived a hard life. He could not find his niche in life. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, where you're just unsettled and you, you don't know your place in life. From a very young age, he had diabetes, and, and um, by the time he came to youth group, his stomach was just hard from the uh, scar tissue of giving himself needles, himself needles every day. And and then on top of that, he got Tourette's syndrome. So he, that, that's horrendous. It's, it makes your social life very hard because in the middle of conversations, you're, you have facial tics and grunts and his eyes would roll back and it'd be like, ah, 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 you know, and he couldn't 
help it. We can imagine what that would do to a kid in high school. And then, meanwhile, he, he wants to serve Jesus. He wants to love Jesus. He doesn't know, you know, where am I going to work? He, he, he got a job in a, in a greenhouse, but he got fired in a few weeks because he couldn't cope with it. So he's in my office complaining, and he says, you know, I call out to God, and he doesn't answer me. Why doesn't he answer me? Why doesn't he speak to me? You know, we've got the Bible, and it's, the Bible says he'll talk to us. The Bible doesn't say, just read me and study me. The Bible says he'll talk to us, and he never does. Now, being a good youth pastor, I joined in. <laughs> yeah, what's the deal with that anyway? It, like I was, um, was kind of grumpy, actually. I was looking at Paul's life, and I thought, if I were Paul, I'm, I'd probably kill myself. It's like courageous of him just to get up the next day. And I'm like complaining with him now. Yeah, how come God doesn't answer us? We call out to him and like nothing comes back. Our prayers hit the, the ceiling. In that moment, a strange thing happened to me. This intrusive thought came into my mind. Do you ever have intrusive thoughts? Some intrusive thoughts are not really helpful. I want to suggest that some intrusive thoughts might be coming from the Lord. Little God thoughts. It just, this thing came in and interrupted me as I'm complaining, and it says this, Job 33, and I thought, that was weird. And I hear it again, Job 33, in my head. And I thought, I wonder what's in Job 33. So I, I went to the shelf and I picked up Job 33 and I don't know if you've ever done this but you flop your Bible open and you look down into verse and I, I flop it open to Job 33 and my eyes land on this verse but I tell you in this you are not right <laughs> for God is greater than man why do you complain to him that he answers none of man's words for God does speak. Now this way, now that way, though man may not perceive it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> I want to keep reading that passage um, because then he goes into a list of all these ways God's already talking to us. It, it's, it's as if I... Um, he was talking the whole time. It's a perception problem. It's a hearing problem. God's not silent. I wasn't listening. So he says, God does speak now one way, now another, though man may not perceive it. Now he gives us a little list. In a dream. So that's, he, the Bible is saying that's one way God speaks. Here's another one. In a vision of the night. When deep Sleep falls on man as they slumber in their beds. Or he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings. Uh-oh. To turn a man from wrongdoing and keep him from pride. To preserve his soul from the pit. Do you ever feel like you get warnings from God? Well, I've got some really good ones. Usually ignored them. That's why I walk with a bit of a limp today. <laughs> Uh, to keep his life from perishing by the sword. Or a man be, may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in his bones so that his very being finds food repulsive. Well, that hasn't happened this weekend. And his soul loathes the choicest meal. His flesh wastes away to nothing and his bones, once hidden, now stick out. Uh, his soul draws near to the pit and his life to the messengers of death. Yet... If there is an angel, uh, we could also translate that messenger. If there's an angel on his side as a mediator, one out of a thousand, to tell a man what is right for him, to be gracious to him, and to say, spare him from going down to the pit. I found a ransom for him. Oh my goodness, this is a complete prophecy about Jesus. I have found a ransom from then his flesh will be renewed like a child's. It is restored as in the days of youth. He prays to God and he finds favor with him. He sees God's face. 
and shouts for joy. He is restored by God to his righteous state. Then he comes to men and says, I've sinned and I've perverted what is right, but I did not get what I deserved. He redeemed my soul from going down to the pit, and I will live to enjoy the light. God, God does all these things to a man or a woman <laughs> twice, even three times to turn his soul back from the pit, that the light of life may shine on him. Pay attention, Job, and listen to me. Be quiet, and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak up, for I want you to be cleared. But if not, listen to me. Now, God's already speaking through Elihu here. But if not, listen to me. Be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. Isn't that cool? I guess like Paul and I started on a journey together after that. I mean, that was, that, was, that was one of those landmark moments where I realized, oh my goodness, God is speaking. And he's speaking in many ways in my life, and I just need to pay attention. So uh, God was very faithful in this because, because uh, in the context of that youth group, we began to see people meeting with the Lord having encounters with Jesus, hearing his voice, and getting transformed. It was marvelous. In those days, I found out this about, about these scriptures. This is not merely a, te- um, a, a book or a history, like a history book of what God did. This is not merely a history book of what God did. This is a testimony of what he does. The, the Bible is a testimony of what he does. And what he does in the scriptures over and over and over. He comes to us, he speaks to us, and he changes us. And I was quite excited about that. So we, we dove in as a youth group. I just want to share a couple of uh, stories about that. I remember Amanda came to us. She was not a believer. She was struggling with anorexia. Uh, In fact, she was so far into it, she was starting to sustain permanent damage to her reproductive system, to her heart. Um, If you you are involved in anorexia enough, you you don't just get bony, you start getting hairy. And uh, it was bad. Uh, On the course she was traveling, she was going to die. Uh, the roots of the anorexia went back to some uh, horrendous encounters as a little girl where she was violated. She shows up at our youth group, and I realized, I cannot fix this, but God has to, or she's done. And so even while she was still an unbeliever, (laughs) some friend dragged her along, and I said, you know what, I heard a rumor that we could ask Jesus to come and we could invite him into those the very roots of the problem, into the very moment when, when this disease and this wound was first established and he would speak to you there. He would meet you there. Interested? And she goes, I'll try anything. So uh, her and her best friend come to my office and... and uh, and, and I just pray this, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I just heard a rumor about this. That you would come into that painful memory where she first sustained this wound, where the lies and the brokenness and the shame first came into her heart. And I said, could you do that? Is that like for real? Amanda says to me, I'm back in, on that day when I was violated. I've just come out of the home where it happened. I'm in my stained little dress. And I said, oh, Jesus, you've got to come. And I held my breath. I said, you, can you find Jesus there anywhere? And she said, yeah, he's waiting for me on the sidewalk. And, 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 I, and I said, Jesus, would you hold out your hand to her? And, and, and she said, he's holding out his hand to me. I'm like, ooh, this works. 
And I said, Jesus, would you take her hand? And Amanda says, he won't take my hand. I'm like, uh-oh. Jesus, why won't you take her hand? And, and, and she says, he's waiting for me to take his hand. I said, do you want to do that? Yes. She sa I said, why don't you go ahead and do that? She says, uh, she just like starts weeping. She said, oh my goodness. As soon as I took his hand, he scooped me up. And he's taken that stained dress and he's taken the stains off my body and he's washed me clean and he's put a brand new white dress on me and he's holding me and loving me. And I'm like, <laughs> that was lucky. No, it's like, thank you, Jesus. I mean, my hair was standing up when I had it. I had goosebumps on my goosebumps because I'm like, God's in the room. We've called on him, and he answered us just like the Bible says. He's really here. This stuff from the book of Acts, this stuff from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's happening here. And I, I said this, to, I, I got this great idea. <laughs> I said, how would you like him to take away every stain from every wrongdoing that's ever happened to you and every wrongdoing that you've ever done? And she says, oh, yeah. I'm like, just tell him that. And so she says that. Jesus, would you remove all my stains from my whole history? And she, and she says, oh, he's saying, no problem. And he washes her clean. And then I said this, so how do you like him so far? She said, oh, I love him. I said, how would you like him to be your best friend for the rest of your life? And she said, yes, please. <laughs> I said, just tell him that. Oh, Jesus, I want you to be my best friend for the rest of my life. Now, here was the crazy thing. She ends up going into this clinic where they work with girls with anorexia. And her counselor or therapist is there. Her, her therapist was not a believer. But her therapist had this little exercise that she likes to do. She says, what I want you to do is in your mind, I want you to climb a mountain. And when you get to the top of the mountain, I want you to meet with your best friend. Who's your best friend? Amanda says, Jesus. She says, that'll do. So session after session, this unbelieving counselor leads her to Jesus and says, okay, Jesus, what do you want to tell her? And she got totally healed. I mean, totally healed. Her reproductive system came back online. She's got like two very active little children now. Uh, she, her, her heart's fine. She got her weight back. The kind of hair went away. And, oh, my goodness. This is for real. Isn't that awesome? Sign me up. Well, I said that. I said, if this is what Jesus can do, sign me up. We started, I started having sessions like this three a week. God started sending people to me. By the time we planted our, the, the church, I was doing eight sessions a week. And I couldn't handle it anymore. So I just started training other people to do it. And I backed off to three. And now, now I don't do it anymore unless I have to. I, we, just have, we have people come from all over the place. Just to regular lay people who can simply ask that question, Jesus, would you come? Of course I will. Would you speak? Of course I will. Would you show yourself? Of course I will. And we see people transformed. So, um, so I'm just really excited today to say, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is real and he's still in action. He's doing his thing in the world and he wants to do it with us. Now, it's one, th it's one thing to, to import this into a into a healing context like this. But what about regular life? What about corporate life? What about our worship life? Is this just like for those crisis moments? Or could I have this every time I pray? Could I have that every time I come to a church service and, and gather with the body of Christ? The sense that Jesus is in the room and that he wants to meet with me, that he wants to speak with me, even if it's just about our friendship. You know, do I have to get anorexia to have him come? No. No. I just said, I just invite him. And um, my, my sense is, even for those of you who, like me, grew up in very conservative settings, and, and we need, you know, we don't want to just say anything goes here. We can have a corporate experience 
of being with Jesus right in, this, in the word of God, the written word. And I, I want to spend, I think I want to spend the rest of uh, our time, the, the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes doing that, where I invite you to walk with me um, through a meeting that John had. But I'm going to ask you a favor. I would like to do this the way they did it in the early church rather than the way they did it in my seminary. My seminary, we would go to the, the passage and we would parse the verbs and we would analyze it and we would dissect it and we would sort it into our knowledge you know, banks in our, our brains and so on. Uh, in the early church, they didn't do that. They would often have a scripture reader And he would read the visions of John as the congregation would prayerfully listen. And the reason they would do that is because when John begins to share his visions of Jesus, he says this to the readers. uh, Blessed is the one who hears these words. He also said, and then he turns to us as readers and he uses this word, behold. Behold means open the eyes of your heart on purpose to see what I have been seeing. So just to give you a preview, he's going to say, behold, a throne. That means John was seeing a throne with the eyes of his heart. He was having a vision of the throne. And he says to the scripture reader, that's us, behold this. Don't just read it. Don't just study it and analyze it and dissect it. Behold it. Look at it in your heart. And use it as an opportunity to meet Jesus yourself. So that's how how, uh, many of the scriptures are meant to function. In fact, the word behold is used 1,400 times in the Bible. It's a command. 80% of the time, it's talking about this. Look at what we saw. And so uh, I'm going to invite you to to step into this passage with me with all five senses. We know he wants you to do that because he describes the sounds. He describes the pictures. He describes the colors. He is guiding us in to his vision. And what better vision is there? Than the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3 says, Set your minds on things above where Christ is now seated in heavenly realms. Well, that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to invite you to pray. Listen prayerfully as I, I read from this uh, chapter. So um, let's, uh, you don't have to do this, but I'd say, let, why don't you go ahead and close, your, close the eyes of your body, but open the eyes of your heart, and we'll just follow John. So, Lord Jesus, we, uh, we thank you that your word says we can come to the throne of grace for help any time we need it. And in Revelation 4, you say to us, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once, I was in the spirit and behold brothers and sisters, a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Those are red and green gems, I believe. And there was a rainbow resembling an emerald and it encircled the throne. Can you see it with the eyes of your heart? Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. And they were dressed in white, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Power. And before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the sevenfold spirit of God. Also before the throne, there's what looks like a sea of glass, 
clear as crystal. Daniel 7 says, there is also a river of fire flowing from the throne. Can you see it? In the center, around the throne, were, tw- were, were uh, four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third has a face like a man, and the fourth was flying like an eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings. Freaky. <laughs> and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. And then in, I saw on the right hand of him who sat in the throne a scroll with writing on both sides. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll. But then one of the elders turns and says to me, Don't weep. Behold, look with the eyes of your heart on purpose. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now here's the surprise. With John, we turn to look at the lion of the tribe of Judah, and what do we see? Behold, a lamb, standing, looking as if it had been slain. And he takes the scroll from the right hand of him who sits on the throne, and when he took it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before the lamb. And each of them... uh, Each of the elders, they they fall before the Lamb. They take their harps, and they're holding golden bowls full of incense. And these are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. You are worthy, O Lamb of God, to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you've made them to be a kingdom of priests and to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousand times ten thousand, encircling the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang together, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, and glory, and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in the seas singing together. To him who sits on the throne and the Lamb be praise, glory, honor, power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. Now I invite you in that picture. Hebrews 12 says, we have come to this mountain. We have come. Ephesians said, we are now seated with Christ in heavenly realms. This means as we're in the throne room, Okay, you could fall down before the throne if you want to. You could stand in the angel choirs if you want to. You could, you could lurk behind the, 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 the lanterns in front of the throne. Or you could you know, tread water in the sea of crystal. But Jesus has already told us where you belong in this picture. In Revelation chapter 3. Let me read it for you. To him who overcomes... I give you the right to sit with me on my throne. So this morning, I invite you to come and just be as children 
walk past the angels, walk past the multitudes, walk past the lanterns and the elders and the four living creatures and crawl up on your daddy's lap. That the little boy or girl inside you would be seated with him. And we can do four things there. As you sit with him on his lap, just tuck right in under his arm. And the first thing I like to do there is intimacy. I just tuck right in. I put my ear on his heart. And I let his heart begin to whisper to me, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you so much. You're mine. You belong to me. You could live your life from here. Just stay close. And that brings me into worship. That's the second thing I do on the throne. Oh, Jesus, there's no one like you. No one like you. No one like you. What other God would let us come sit with him? What other God would hold us close and treat us like children rather than like slaves? What other God who's so holy and pure would, would allow me to come? And instead of acting like I'm all defiled, you wash my stains just by holding me. You're so wonderful. You're precious, Lord. And so this is our worship in the throne room. You're, you're, in your power, you're so tender. In your greatness, you're so gentle. I also, I, I also like to do um, intercession from the throne. When we pray for others, don't, you don't need ever again to come grovel before God. Just go sit on his lap, and anybody who you want to pray for, just bring them before that throne. Let's do it right now. Lord, Just we bring our loved ones before the throne. We bring uh, this, this uh, woman in Guatemala, we bring her before the throne. We bring our children before the throne, our spouse, our parents, our best friends. Anybody you know who needs to come, just bring them there now. And from his lap, we say, oh, Jesus, what do you have for them today? Would you lay your wounded hand of blessing on them? He's like, of course I would. Would you lay your wounded hand of healing on them? Just begin to pour out the grace that comes from your heart. On it. And he's like, of course I will. In fact, he may even want to bring them up on his other lap. He's got two knees, you know. Now just get in real, tuck in safe with him. In, in addition to doing intimacy and worship and intercession there, I, I just want to pray a little warfare prayer. Uh, did you know the enemy also has a place in the throne room? It's called the footstool. And sometimes we believe the enemy has just, you know, we've experienced him pounding us. But, you know, in God's throne room, there's no such thing as a, you know, big demon. They are under his feet. Now, if you can, if you can catch this, you're on his, the Lord's knee and the enemy's under his feet. I recommend bouncing a little. So, Lord Jesus Christ, wherever the enemy has come after my brothers and sisters here, I, call, I, I just call on the name of the, of the king of the universe to bring the enemy that's come after their health, that's come after their families, that's come after their destiny. Just place those things under arrest and put them under your feet and we just bounce a little. Romans 16, 19 says, <laughs> the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. And that's all the attention we need to give the enemy this morning. And just, just back to intimacy. Oh Lord, thanks for making us your children. You're so kind to us. And I feel like he just wants to give you a promise right now. Why don't you just listen for a moment? Lord, if you had a promise for me today, what would it be?